Last week, we were able to talk about a conflict over women's ordination that did not result in schism in our church. And this week, we're going to talk about a conflict, the conflict over slavery, that did result in schism. And part of what we're doing um, is Sankofa, and this is the image of Sankofa um, that comes from Ghana, and it means to go back to the past to fetch what we need for the future. And so the bird's feet, if they would be pictured, would be painting, would be pictured facing forward while the bird is going back to get the egg from the past that they will then carry into the future. And so part of this is knowing and looking at where we have been um, for the work ahead and finding a way forward into the future. And what I would like is this is just going to be a history rundown, kind of a Methodism 101 moment of what happened around that time period, um, around slavery and what led up to the schism. And after that, then we'll come back to the sanctuary after we have a coffee and, and um, cookie moment and then talk about this in relationship to where we are today. This is... Um, me waiting to do the application part until we can all do it together to honor the requests that came from our church profile um, process that um, people wanted to talk about it, but wanted to talk about it in a group where there could be multiple voices instead of just the one voice of a sermon. And then also, um, to be ready for that, what I would ask is that as we're going through the history and as we're going through the quotes um, from the delegates of that 1840 General Conference, um, if you could just stay aware of what is resonating with you and where you feel power and yes and what's sitting really uncomfortably and where you have that little E moment and just pay attention to how you're responding and what your body and spirit are picking up on um, so that then we can have a conversation of what what we need to fetch from the past for today and for the future. The scriptures that Pam just read for us are the scriptures that were used in the debate over slavery. And so we have um, others that were used as well um, from those who were pro-slavery, um, but the only scripture that was ever referenced and not with the Matthew or the gospel um, uh, reference in it was the golden rule from the north and abolitionists simply using that and I find that interesting um, in that we continue in this divide of um, scripture being used um, more thoroughly um, in what we would overgeneralize um, in saying our more conservative members and scripture not being used as much um, by what we would overgeneralize into the category of our progressive members. Members. And scripture is our lifeblood. It is our guide and who and where we are. And so I'd like for us to keep that dynamic in mind as well as we go through this. Because it would have been a very interesting conversation, Barry, if we had turned to Exodus and looked at the process there, to not mistreat or oppress an immigrant because you were once immigrants in the land of Egypt, did not mistreat the widow or the orphan, um, and, and as the wives um, go on in the empathy statement, then your wives will be widows and your children will be orphans. Um, is that all three of the verses, Barry? So part of this and part of Exodus is what comes, what births the liberation theology ethic. And so in scripture, we have scripture that points to God ordering slavery, and we have scripture that points to God rescuing slaves and abolishing slavery from Exodus and from, from the time of Pharaoh in Egypt. And the theological conversation that we missed in this moment um, was putting these scriptures in conversation together and from that talking about who we believe God to be then and what these both say about God. And that's a conversation that I hope that we don't have to miss again as we are in this similar and parallel situation today. And so we go forward by looking back <laughs> 
And in the late 1700s and early 1800s, we were very fiercely opposed to slavery as United Methodists. The 1784 Christmas Conference was the conference that established United Methodism as a denomination here in the United States, and that conference was held at Lovely Lane Church in Baltimore. And at that conference, um, the stipulation was put that all people, all American United Methodists, must set their slaves free by the next year, by the next annual conference. That did not happen. Um, there were many who advocated. Um, Koch's life um, was threatened more than once, and Francis Asbury, our first American ordained at that conference, our first bishop, um, although they weren't called bishops then, um, brought petitions to George Washington to emancipate slaves as well. And so there was very much a strong abolitionist movement in the beginning. But then as that scriptural and theological ideal butted up against a very real cultural reality, um, things started to erode. And by 1816, the General Conference Committee on Slavery published the following statement. Under the present existing circumstances in relation to slavery, little can be done to abolish a practice so contrary to the principles of moral justice. They are sorry to say that the evil appears to be past remedy. And as we continue into the 1800s, it gets even harder. And battle lines are very clearly drawn at this point between the abolitionists and the Southern Methodists. Um, and we have a quote from Gilbert Haven, a New England um, Southern jurisdiction here, um, and who states that slavery is not only a moral evil, but a pestiferous, everybody who just wants to say that word, right? Sin that must be uprooted. Okay, and then we have, I'm sorry, I missed, um, so we have the abolitionist. Gilbert Haven was the one who then came with the following quote um, that says, following back to the Genesis passage that we just read, if the Bible sanctions slavery, we will commend it. And that comes from the Methodist Quarterly Review. With regards to the discussion around the golden rule that the North, uh, the North was using, um, this quarterly publishes the statement, the principle of slavery does not conflict with the proper lines of the law of human love. And there's another quote that's coming um, on the next side that says that because God ordained slavery, because it is in keeping with God's will and the way that God has set up the universe, then it doesn't, then we are treating one another the way that we ought to be treated because that is in keeping with the way that God has set up the law of the land. So because the golden rule is not set against God's order, but operating within God's order, it cannot be used against slavery as slavery has already been proven through scripture to be ordained of God. And that's where we miss having that conversation that could have happened in Exodus of a God who has broken slavery. And that's on, on those of us um, in the North who were not using scripture in a way that it could have been for a conversation to be had at that point. The moderates in the middle um, were calling the church to not meddle with a secular issue. We have a quote from Moses Henkel here. Um, in 1851, it is impossible to regulate this matter by ecclesiastical action, for it involves a civil relation with which the church cannot safely intermeddle. And so we have abolitionists calling for the end of slavery. We have Southern Methodists calling for it to be maintained and of the order of God. And we have people for calling it to not be an issue brought into the church because it is a political one of the state and does not belong in debate in the church. And this brings us to 1840 to the General Conference in the case of Silas Comfort um, and the resolution that condemned black testimony in church trials and states that prohibited it. This is the first time that there's a direct law made in our church um, of discrimination. Um, so even though people had not um, fulfilled the order to release slaves and there had been no direct action, right, against. And so this is the direct action against of putting what was in state law then into church law instead of church law informing how we lived as citizens. And the focus at this point had been on not enforcing 
that John Wesley's command um, and the call of general conference or the call of the Christmas conference in 1784 to release slaves because people were so nervous about keeping the southern states from breaking away, from the southern Methodists from breaking away um, from the Methodist church. Um, and then after that 1840 conference and black testimony being outlawed, that was the last straw for an abolitionist wing. And so it wasn't the Southerners who um, schism first, but the abolitionist group on the other end of the spectrum and the conversation. And they formed the Wesleyan Methodist Connection in 1843 with 6,000 people. And this is their quote. We wish it may be distinctly understood that we do not withdraw from anything essential to pure Wesleyan Methodism. We only dissolve our connection with episcopacy and slavery. These we believe to be anti-scriptural and well calculated to sustain each other. Mary. And this leads then two years into the General Conference of 1844. And so what had been such a concern of schism had already happened. And then because of that, the moderate group begins voting with the anti-slavery forces instead of the Southern delegates to keep them in. And this is what shifts the balance and leads to the schism. There are two votes that are taken up at this general conflict, um, at this general conference um, of a clergyman and a bishop holding slaves as trustees. So they didn't buy them themselves, um, but they inherited them um, from their wives. And the pastor's appeal to his being suspended from office for failure to free the slaves was rejected. So that means um, he was continued to be suspended from office. And that vote went 117 to 56, a very clear majority. The bishop was ordered to desist from the exercises of his office so long as this impediment, the slaves that he was holding as trustee, remained. And that vote ended at 110 to 68. The first position, uh, petition was for him to resign completely. That was edited in an amendment down to him not fulfilling his duties as long as he remained trustee of the slaves. And as soon as that ended, then they would welcome him back in. And because of these votes and that split, then there was another group that got together um, and then set, this, set the terms um, for with the withdrawal and our church split um, into the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Um, it was, would not be until 1968 that we would reunite um, those two with the Evangelical um, Association and the United Brethren to form the United Methodist Church, and that happened again in 1968. And so this is a conflict in which we did schism, um, in which there were extremes and a middle trying to find their way, in which it wasn't just one schism, um, but multiple. And the theological questions before us then and before us now, could slavery, a man-made institution, be an evil without involving men in sin? And what is more important, the forthright proclamation of the gospel to people or prophetic judgment on society? These questions come from all of the pieces of the debate that was happening. Slavery existed, it was a given. And since it was a given institution, um, did it mean that we were sinning and just being a part of that institution or not? Many people advocated that we had to let that institution be so that we could work within it to preach and connect with the slaves and save their souls. And then many others said that their personal salvation was not as important as eradicating the institution and ending it. So what is the relationship between personal salvation and moral ethic? When do politics matter in the church? When does the church need to give a statement or a witness? And what is sin in the face of systems and in the face of individual actions? These are the questions that were before us then. 
And these are the questions that are before us now. And so we will continue um, in this service and closing with our hymn, but I hope that after getting our coffee and having a moment, we can gather back up in the sanctuary to continue the conversation of where we feel God calling us and how to respond in this time.